Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 148 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. This week, we welcome a true renaissance man to the program. Paul Sheldon, as you are all about to hear, has led an interesting and colorful life and has leveraged those experiences into a variety of worthwhile endeavors. Paul is a collaborative fundraising development consultant dedicated to long-term sustainability, equity, and altruistic creativity. His specialties include fundraising, organizational management, staff development, principles of sustainable management, implementing sustainability in business, capital acquisition, board development, and, and I love this one, realizing dreams. I truly don't think I could come up with an introduction which would adequately encapsulate Paul's journey. So I am going to simply get out of the way and let Paul paint that picture for himself. Now, as I was interviewing Paul, we discovered that he has so much to share that to give each of his endeavors their due diligence, we would break this up into two episodes. So this week, we will be dropping part one with part two of my interview with Paul Sheldon to be dropping sometime in the very near future. Now, please enjoy part one of my conversation with Paul Sheldon, and I will see you all on the other side. Welcome to the show, Paul. Why don't we start off, as I like to do, by you introducing yourself to the listeners. Maybe just tell us about what your journey has been like up to this point, perhaps highlighting those educational and professional milestones before we roll up our sleeves and tackle, take a look at some of these fascinating topics that we're going to cover today with you, Paul. Thanks, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, very interested in corrections as a field. I'm not a professional corrections person in the sense that I haven't worked inside a prison or a jail as a staff person. Uh, But my father was a sociologist. My mother was a probation officer. She eventually rose to be in charge of the criminal justice system of L.A. County, which is larger than many states. And so I feel a sense of affinity every time we passed. I grew up in Los Angeles area, and every time we passed a prison, my father would talk about it, talk about criminal thinking and what do we do with criminals and what do we do with people who don't follow the rules and how, how do we evolve a society that welcomes people who have changed their ways. And that sort of conversation was common in my house. I had four lawyers in my immediate family. So our idea of polite dinner conversation was to argue a point of law. And uh, (laughs) I I was well into my adulthood before I realized that there are people who don't argue at the dinner table. Um, (laughs) I, I grew up in Hollywood as a dancer. Uh, In high school and college, I was a performing dancer. I've taught traditional folk dances to more than 150,000 people. I performed before live audiences in in total of hundreds of thousands of people. And it it was in my late 20s that I finally conceded that being a dancer is kind of like being an athlete. It's a limited career. I couldn't do it when I was leading dancing five nights a week and uh, teaching or leading dancing at bar mitzvahs and weddings and community festivals on the weekends. At the peak of my career, I got up to maybe earning $1,500 a month. 
which in the 1970s was comfortable, but I wasn't going to buy a house like that. And so I eventually set dancing aside into a, a hobby, which I still pursue, uh, and asked the question, what am I going to do with my life? Um, this was the 70s. So I, I entered college as a math major. I did very well on the math SAT tests. And I, but I picked Duquesne University because Duquesne had a very good folk dance group called the Duquesne Tamboritsons. So I went to school for a couple of years in Pittsburgh. And at registration, I heard about existential phenomenological psychology. <laughs> what? <laughs> So I changed from a math major to a psychology major and started studying consciousness. Um, ah. I, I had half a scholarship for playing tennis, and the other half was covered by Occidental College, where my father was on the faculty as part of a tuition exchange program that pri private colleges have in the United States. So I qualify as a privileged white guy. Uh, went, went to college on a scholarship. But my dad died when I was 20 in the second year of my college education and Occidental in their wisdom said, well, your dad's not on the faculty anymore. Your scholarship's gone. And half a tennis, half a tennis scholarship wasn't enough. So I ended up coming back to California and trying to find another college where I could study existential phenomenological psychology. <laughs> and, and my proposal was something having to do with human awareness. I wanted to study human awareness. What is human awareness? Can we study awareness separate from the contents of awareness? And I couldn't find a faculty person who understood what I was talking about. As I said, this is the 70s in California, so I learned transcendental meditation, and I learned Aikido and Judo and Zen meditation and studied Sufism. And I started out as a normal, healthy, born-again Christian, but, you know, I kind of turned into a, a normal, healthy, tree-hugging, dirt-worshipping, whale-loving, commie pinko from California, um, <laughs> which, which is kind of fun in the corrections work. We'll talk about that a little later. But... I ended up with a study of human development at a little college in Pasadena called Pacific Oaks, and I completed both bachelor's and master's degrees in human development. I looked at being a therapist, but I felt that the problems that people bring into therapy are, are not terribly interesting. You know, how do I get along with my spouse? How do I quit smoking? How do I lose weight? How do I feel better about myself? Those are all important developmental issues, but I was much more oriented towards social issues. And how do we make a society that works for everyone? How do we create a world that is benign and compassionate and that it has limits, but also for the mainstream is a place where it's, it's satisfying and fun and joyful to be a part of a community, of a, of a company, of a society. And that was what really interested me. And so I didn't become a therapist and I, I, titled my position as a development consultant, which allowed me to do a lot of things, particularly help altruistic nonprofit charities to achieve their mission. My master's thesis was titled Dreams for the Future, and I studied how people's lives change when they have a dream to live for that's bigger than themselves. And that led me into what is it like to have a life that's, the phrase I use is a life worth giving, a life that's dedicated to purpose and meaning, to making the world a better place. And of course, everybody does that in their own way. It might be taking care of your kids or taking care of your spouse, but it always involves taking care and giving care and developing compassion and kindness. And so that was where I started out, was raising money. Uh, as I started into the working world, I tried to find, with an organization that I worked with, what is it that nobody else is doing that I can do? I don't want to displace somebody else. I want to come in and take somebody else's job, but I want to contribute. My favorite job description is find what's needed and wanted and provide it. And it was surprising to me, uh, for a string of organizations, how often that was raising the money and accounting for the money everybody wanted to do the altruistic mission, but nobody knew how to raise the money. 
So once again, in the 70s, I, I learned how to raise money. I studied with Irving Warner, who wrote the book, The Art of Fundraising, and learned about nonprofit fundraising, which also generalized into business fundraising. And um, I, I won't go on too long here, but uh, through a series of coincidences, after being the director of community services for the city of Sierra Madre, my former wife and I ended up moving to Aspen. And I spent seven years in Aspen working on real estate development, running hotels and condominiums and timeshare properties in Aspen and Snowmass and Vail and other ski resorts, which once again was kind of uh, archetypical white privilege, you know, the four bedroom, three bath house with a view of the ski slope. And I skied 100 days a year and maybe worked seven, eight months out of the year uh, and lived in Aspen and loved it. Um, I helped a group in Old Snowmass, Colorado, that was co-founded by my sister. Uh, my sister's name is Hunter Lovins, and your listeners can Google Hunter Lovins, L-O-V-I-N-S, and learn more about her work. Uh, but she was friends with John Denver, and John Denver had started the Windstar Foundation in Old Snowmass. And Hunter and her then-husband, Amory, wanted to start a think tank dedicated to natural resources policy. And we argued a lot around my mom's dining room table about what's the purpose of the Rocky Mountain Institute. What we eventually came up with was a, a natural resources policy think and do tank dedicated to energy, water, arable land, national defense, and the links among them. Now, that's Maybe a little easier to understand than existential phenomenology, but still, you know, not a normal <laughs> dinner conversation. But at the time, we're talking the late 70s, we had been through the energy crisis. Uh, we'd been through Jimmy Carter, bless his heart. Uh, I send him all good wishes as he's entering hospice. Um, you know, he was wearing a, a sweater in the White House. And... Um, and we learned that we, our economy is seriously dependent on fossil fuels and nuclear fuels. And Amory wrote a book in the 70s where he documented that the U.S. is taking energy solutions worst by first. Building a nuclear power plant or coal-fired power plant to provide electricity to heat water for coffee or to chill beer to 65 degrees is the most expensive – most vulnerable way to meet our energy needs. And his book was called Soft Energy Paths, and we can talk more about that if, if there's time. But we started the Rocky Mountain Institute in Old, Snow in Old Snowmass around 1983. And about 30 years later, I was working with my sister on another project to help Walmart create green jobs. Uh, Walmart wanted all the jobs at Walmart to be green jobs. And a horseshoer in Colorado challenged me. He said, you think green jobs are the answer to everything, but I'll tell you one group of people who are not going to get green jobs, and that's people who've been in jail or in prison. And they're, they're lucky if they get any job. And if you really – if you want to walk your talk, what you would do is create a job training program for incarcerated people so that while they're incarcerated, they can learn green job skills and get green jobs when they get out. And I took it kind of like a dare. I, I wrote some proposals. I spent a better part of a year raising money to create a pilot program for green jobs training for people who are incarcerated. I failed. <laughs> uh, we did not succeed in raising the money we needed. We created a great program. It, it was called Cleaning Green Jobs. But along the way, uh, one of the people that uh, provided some funding to create this proposal was Marvin Klein, who started a company called Correct Pack in Chicago. It was a subsidiary of another company he started called Portion Pack, and they made ecologically friendly janitorial cleaning supplies. And they innovated the idea of rather than shipping a 40 gallon oil drum of janitorial solution. They would create packets that were plastic sealed that would be shipped at a tenth or, or a twentieth of the volume and then diluted with water on site. And that's why it's the pack part of their name is these little color-coded plastic packs. And I went to talk with Marmon about supporting my Clean and Green Jobs proposal. And he said, you know what? We've got a correctional advisory board 
that advises us because because prisons love correct pack products because if somebody throws uh, one of their products in the eyes of a staff person, it, they just wash it out with water. They're non toxic and non caustic. Or if an incarcerated person drinks them trying to kill themselves, they get a stomach ache. They're non toxic, and so. Uh, they had this correctional advisory board that was helping them offer correct pack products to correctional institutions. And it was five guys uh, in in Chicago that came together for a meeting, and Marvin had me come in to, to talk with them about my proposal. <clears throat> I had a 72-page slide presentation prepared. My third slide was something like, the science of climate change is uncertain. We don't really know what's going to happen. And the former commissioner from the state of Louisiana leaned forward and said, Bob, could you say that again? And I said, sure, the science of climate change is uncertain. And the former commissioner from the state of Kentucky looked at me and he said, damn, boy, you're the first greenie I ever heard admit that. At that point, Marvin's son, Bert, who was the president of Portion Pack at the time, literally kicked me in the ankle under the table. And he motioned to me and he said, shut your laptop, shut your mouth, don't say another thing. And I whispered to him, Bert, I have 70 slides to go. (laughs) (laughs) He said, shut your mouth, shut your laptop, don't say another word. And these guys started talking for about 20 minutes. They asked me questions and I answered their questions. And essentially what they said, and I, I don't... I'll uh, censor what they actually said. They said, I think this green stuff is a bunch of hooey. And uh, I think that Al Gore is is a liability to our country. But I think there's money on the table here and we ought to get some of it. And I agreed. And after chatting a little while longer, uh, the the ex-commissioner, former commissioner from Kentucky said to me, could you write us a proposal to establish a committee for the American Correctional Association. We just want like a one-page charter to authorize the American Correctional Association to create a committee to look into how to save money while maintaining security and safety through these green practices that you're talking about. And I said, sure. And so on the plane back uh, from Chicago to Colorado, I I wrote – a one page, actually it was two pages, <laughs> proposed charter for a committee to create green, clean and green jobs and clean and green jobs training for prisons. They worked with it a little bit. Bert and I, Bert Klein and I worked on it a lot. Um, we eventually came up with a charter, which they presented to the American Correctional Association. And ACA created an ad hoc committee called the Clean and Green Committee based on what we had developed. And that was, I think, 2010, maybe 2011. And they uh, they asked me to come to New Orleans to the ACA conference uh, to be on the committee and to help form this committee. Then I finally got to do my 72-slide presentation. <laughs> and I remember Jim <laughs> Gondles from ACA stuck his head into the room. Richard Stalder was uh, the, the retired commissioner from Louisiana. And he, he, Jim Gondles came into the room while we were the committee was meeting, and he said, "I just had to see the group that turned Richard Stalder into a liberal," which of course was greeted with round laughter, <laughs> <laughs> because Richard Stalder introduced me by saying, "You know, I'm a whiskey drinking, gun toting, lifelong conservative Republican corrections commissioner," and. I don't know what I'm doing in the same room with this tree-hugging, dirt-worshipping, whale-loving commie pinko from Oregon. At the time, it was Colorado. Uh, which <laughs> And uh, Doug Dredke has used that same phrase to introduce me when we do programs together, and so has uh, various other people. Um, because they kind of adopted me as their pet greenie. Uh, with two or three other people, I sort of became the go-to person at ACA. And I hope I'm not prattling on too long here. I'll uh, I'll just uh, say a few more things and then I'll I'll give you a chance to get a word in edgewise. One of the people who was on that committee uh, 
was the deputy commissioner in the state of Colorado who had been the warden for Colorado Supermax facility at, in, um, in Canyon City. And he came to me after the meetings and he said, you know, at the National Institute of Justice uh, Corrections Technology Center of Excellence, the, the National Law Enforcement and Corrections Technology Center of Excellence, We've been trying to write a book on sustainability-oriented practices in corrections for several years now, and we can't get our arms around what it is. Is it, you know, is it environmental? Is it jobs? Is it energy? Is it water? Is it composting? Is it gardens? Is it transportation? What is it? And we talked for a little bit. He said, you know, maybe you can help with this. So we teamed up. He got a little grant from the National Institute of Justice to, to write a manual which we titled the Greening Corrections Technology Guidebook. And it, uh, it went over, it was based on an article that Bert Klein and I had written for the North American Association of Wardens and Superintendents a year or two earlier uh, called Seven Steps, Seven Steps to Sustainable Corrections to address all these different issues. And uh, it was a wonderful book. Uh, we had a number of collaborators and... It's been downloaded more than 10,000 times from the National Institute of Justice website, and it's, it, it, I think it has provided a useful resource to corrections professionals who want to maintain safety and security, who want to save money or identify new sources of revenue by implementing sustainability-oriented practices. And at the same time, the same two people uh, from Kentucky and Louisiana, uh, the Kentucky commissioner is John Reese, who's just a wonderful resource person. Uh, they asked me to write a standard, to, to draft an audit standard for ACA to use to select what practices qualify as environmentally responsible or sustainability oriented. And how does an ACA auditor or an ACA accreditation manager evaluate whether or not their facility is up to speed, is is keeping with the times about being environmentally responsible and sustainability oriented in the way that they implement their institution. So I did. And uh, Richard and John took it to ACA and, and got it adopted very quickly. Uh, it, it took less than a year. and then We made some tweaks. And, and then after that, they asked me to write a policy. And I said, wait, you already have a standard. What, what's a policy? <laughs> and they said, no, no, a policy is a value statement that ACA is going to declare this is our value with regard to sustainability-oriented and environmentally responsible practices. So I wrote a draft, and they tweaked it a little bit, and ACA adopted that, I think, in 2012. And it became the standard and the policy that is there at ACA. To, to this day, the Clean and Green Committee has been made a permanent standing committee it's one of the largest, most active committees at ACA. It's a wonderful cross-section of corrections professionals at the county, state, federal, military, international level uh, who are interested in those topics. There are vendors in there. There are juvenile corrections people. Uh, there are nonprofit activist groups that participate. There are usually 30 or 40 people at the meetings at ACA. And they asked me to rename it because Clean and Green was just a little too... California, Colorado, Oregon for the ACA constituency. So unfortunately, the name we came up with was the Sustainability Oriented and Environmentally Responsible Practices and Corrections Committee. Uh, try that as an acronym. A mouthful. <laughs> but that's where it stands. Uh, it, there are hundreds of facilities all over the country and other facilities from around the world because of ACA and NAWS, the North American Association of Wardens and Superintendents, having demonstrated leadership in these areas that are actively engaged in maintaining safety and security while also implementing cost-saving and revenue-generating activities around the themes of sustainability and environmental responsibility. And that's what got me involved in corrections. <laughs> First of all, Paul, never uh, pol apologize for prattling on. As an interviewer, I I, I love when <laughs> my guests um, really share their, their experiences and insights, which you just did there artfully. Let me ask you this. All of this then sort of came to a – came to the fruition of you're now 
owner of greenprison.org, and you were mentioning practices, policies, and whatnot. So for the listener out there, what might – how can I phrase this? I like to use, for example, case studies when I, when I highlight – practices or, or, or philosophies or what have you. So let's maybe like do a case study of two institutions. What does that look like if your, if your work is being followed through on, or, you know, what does a good day look like at greenprison.org? If you can point to a facility or a jail or a prison, who's taking your advice? Yeah, there are, there are various institutions in, in Washington and in Oregon, in Massachusetts, in Kansas, in Indiana, uh, Surprising places in Arkansas and Texas uh, that are actively engaged in becoming sustainability-oriented facilities. The Pitches Detention Center in L.A. County, uh, one of the captain who was in charge of that facility said to me at a conference 10 years ago, we'd like to have Pitches Detention Center become a facility where people come to use their time of incarceration to learn a more sustainable way of life to turn in their red and blue bandana head coverings and their, and their wave caps for a green banner that helps them become contributing members of the community when they get out. And, and so I, I won't flag any particular institution, but I will say that, that Oregon and Washington are definitely leading the country on implementing across the board sustainability-oriented practices and, you know, there are certain flagship aspects that get people's attention. Recycling is one where there's a, an opportunity to make money. And it was an institution in Ohio, sorry, in Indiana that I first visited that had implemented a recycling program to do aluminum cans and uh, paper and cardboard recycling. It was 1,200 inmates, and they saved $140,000 the first year on their trash hauling fees. That got the warden's attention. And then somebody said to them, you know, you could sell this stuff. <laughs> so somebody donated a baler, and they started baling cardboard and baling plastic bottles and uh, aluminum cans and and selling them. And so the second year, they generated $100,000, $120,000 in new revenue. So that was a $260,000 swing in two years. That got people's attention. And, th and that led them to do composting, uh, where they're, they were taking all their food waste and putting them out in windrows and turning them with skip loaders and, and then spreading that compost out on highways. They had a seed breeding program, a seed propagation program where they created seed that was used by the state highway department to spread out on the highways. Uh, they implemented a wood-fired boiler system because this particular institution happens to have a pallet recycling plant as part of their prison industry. You know, wooden pallets have a limited useful life because this, the forklifts hit the leading board of the pallet and it splinters. And after, you know, a few uses, it has to be discarded. And if somebody at this prison had come up with the innovative idea to put a, a plant in there to replace the leading edge boards on the pallets and put them back into circulation. But then they had all these boards that they were throwing to the landfill. And so they bought a machine to pelletize the wood and burn it in a wood-fired boiler, which gave them 85% of their heat for hot water and heating their buildings for free. Um, an another exemplary institution is the Boulder County Jail in Boulder, Colorado, which has a two-acre site adjacent to the jail where they grow all the vegetables that everybody in the institution eats all summer long. And there are prisons in Texas now that have... Uh, there's a, an officer down there who issued the, a green prisons challenge to have institutions serve one salad a week using vegetables that are grown on site. And, and, you know, there's just fun things going on like that. Ohio and 
Oregon had a competition on green buildings to see who had the most efficient buildings. Ohio won. <laughs> um, Compet- competition's a good thing, yeah. Yeah, and we're um, developing a Green Prisons Challenge on greenprisons.org uh, to, based on the National Institute of Justice guidebook that uses a checklist for 13 items that institutions can use to verify whether they're engaged in green practices. And that's that's really where the rubber meets the road is, are you engaged in tokenism? Are you doing one thing or are you doing everything? Because the institutions that do everything save millions. The institutions that do one or two things save money. But they aren't taking advantage of the opportunity, and that's what the Memphis County Jail found when they went to visit Ohio and saw what Ohio was doing in some of their facilities. Ohio implemented an education program called Roots of Success that was developed by a wonderful woman out of Berkeley, California, named Raquel Penderhughes, who also published a guidebook for the National Institute of Corrections on greening prisons that has wonderful resources in it. And Roots of Success is a job readiness program that, that does what I was proposing to do with our Clean and Green Jobs training program. It's a job readiness program that helps participants acquire the skills that they need to get a green job. It was designed originally for use in community colleges and high schools, but the Roots of Success people did a wonderful job of adapting it for use in prisons as a training program. And, and out of that, Ohio also because Gary Moore was there as the commissioner, really looked at what can we do across the boards to implement sustainability-oriented practices. So they had recycling, they had gardens, they had solar panels, they were looking at doing wind, they were reducing transportation uses, they were using video visits, they were reducing their water use, they were using non-toxic, non-caustic chemicals in their cleaning processes. They did everything they could find to do And that was how we wrote the ACA standard, was to make it cost-effective and feasible. Just do that. Don't even try to invest anything. Just save money. Now, when we started the ACA program, I'm coming around to talking about green prisons here. Tommy Norris, who had been a curriculum director for National Institute of Corrections, got tapped by John Reese and Richard Stalder to co-chair the Clean and Green Committee. John Reese said he would do it if Tommy did it. (laughs) And Tommy agreed to co-chair the committee in those early days back more than a decade ago now. And Tommy is, uh, I have tremendous respect for Tommy. He's he's retired now, but he has a wonderful track record of dedication to corrections in so many ways. And he honestly said, I don't know anything about sustainability. I don't even know what it is. But he drank the green Kool-Aid. He, he really dove in and, and had me and some other people who were wonderful resource people, uh, the folks from Washington State, Dan Pacholke and Nalini Nadkarni, and the folks from the Sustainability in Prisons Project come in uh, to do presentations and podcasts and recordings to, to, to create the resources available. And he started this website called greenprisons.org that is dedicated to providing resources to correctional institutions to implement sustainability-oriented and environmentally responsible practices and ran it for 10 years. He focused very much on resources through vendors like, okay, suppose you want to green your prison. Who do you turn to? If you want to put on solar panels, if you want to start a recycling program, if you want to put a garden in, who do you turn to? Uh, If you want less uh, if you want porous paving, for example, that's, that doesn't just have all the water run off into the local creek from your parking lots, who do you go to? Uh, and, and so he spent 10 years developing relationships and, and getting resources. It, it kind of went dormant during the pandemic. Everybody's budgets were cut. They were understaffed. People were desperate just to provide security. And nobody was looking at not nobody, but very few institutions had green practices as a priority. So when Tommy retired, uh, I, I went to him and said, hey, Tommy, how about if I take over the, mo- the wonderful legacy that you've established here with green prisons and, it, and revitalize the website and continue to offer the resources? And, and we worked out an arrangement to, to do that. And so I'm now responsible for greenprisons.org, and we are in the process of revitalizing and 
generating new outreach around this challenge, the Green Prisons Challenge, of using the checklist that Tommy and I developed based on the National Institute of Justice guidebook to help institutions implement cost-effective, cost-saving measures that increase safety and security while being more environmentally and sustainability-oriented. Paul, what I will do is leave a link for greenprison.org in the episode description of this podcast so folks can just read the description of this episode. They'll see the link and they can click on it to get some of that awesome information that you've been providing about that movement, which sounds incredible. Let's uh, change gears a little bit, although with your impressive and – Diverse background. It's no surprise when I look at your body of work. There's so much various fascinating um, things here. I have a confession to make for quite a while a few years back. I went down the lucid dreaming rabbit hole. And so ah. when I saw when I saw Dreamosophy uh, as part of your bio, Paul, I thought, okay, I've got to talk to him among other things about lucid dreaming, but tell the listeners all about Dreamosophy. It is fascinating. Thank you. Uh, after almost a decade of working on greening prisons, I felt like we had largely hit momentum. The ACA policy and standard were in place. The National Institute of Justice guidebook was out. The National Institute of Corrections guidebook was out. Uh, people started retiring. My partner in writing the Green Corrections Manual, uh, Gene Atherton, retired. Tommy Norris retired. Commissioner Stalder retired. Commissioner Reese had already retired. Um, it, and it, it seemed like we had put the wheels in motion. Uh, the information necessary to accomplish the greening of corrections is available. And Green Prisons was uh, launched. It was out there. It's a resource. It still is uh, a resource. We haven't really had to do very much updating of the website at Green Prisons because principles haven't changed. I started working on this in the 1970s, and uh, we're still dealing with a lot of the same issues. And the obstacles are not financial. They're not technological. They're political. Uh, people will do what they want to do. So I uh, – as you recall, my master's thesis was titled Dreams for the Future, and I've always been interested in dreaming. And in the late 1970s, while I was working on my master's thesis, I learned about lucid dreaming. I learned about the phenomenon that happens spontaneously to many people, but can also be learned, which is to recognize yourself as the dreamer. Uh, of course, the first step is to recognize that you're dreaming. <clears throat> oh, gosh, I'm in a dream. I'm talking with my dead father. Gee, I must be dreaming. Uh, I'm flying. Gee, I wonder if I'm dreaming. Uh, or, or any another anomaly comes up and people learn to question, am I dreaming? And I, I encountered the work of a man named Stephen LaBerge who wrote the book Lucid Dreaming. This is before he had written the book. He was a graduate student at Stanford. And he was in the laboratory developing scientific means to be able to prove as a dreamer to people who are awake in a laboratory that he was dreaming and knew that he was dreaming. It was a, there's a long story to go with that, but suffice it to say that what he devised was a system of communicating while the electronic equipment was verifying that he was dreaming he could communicate via Morse code, and he sent out his initials, SLB, via Morse code to the researchers that proved that he was dreaming and he knew that he was dreaming while he was dreaming. It's the ultimate virtual reality. It's just amazing. And, of course, dreaming is like being in an isolation tank. You know, you're inside a realm that I call the dream stream that is a mystery. Nobody really knows what's going on. The Psychobiologists will tell you that it's electrochemical firings of neurons in the brain. And uh, the mystics will tell you that you're into the bardo, the dream time, the other side of where we came from before we were born and where we're going to when we die. Nobody really knows what, what that experience is. But I've always been fascinated by it. And some friends in St. Louis said, well, you have to write a book. 
because uh, in the 19, I, I experimented with lucid dreaming for about 15 years, and it was a very spiritual experience for me. It's an opportunity to commune with divine presence directly. And it was quite profound for me. And I was given some words and language to rally, kind of rival existential phenomenological psychology, the stuff that I got into with studying philosophy and consciousness and the history of religions and all those sorts of things because of the dream inquiries. And some friends said, you have to write a book. And I had encountered some folks in Southern California in the late 70s who had done some pioneering work on cultivating dream life. It wasn't specifically about lucid dreaming per se, but it was more about experiencing your dream life. This is a different way of approaching dreaming than interpreting dreams to find out what they mean. The old model from a 1,000 or 5,000 years ago is that recalling a dream is unusual, and if you recall a dream, it's an omen, and you have to interpret the dream in order to understand what the message is, not just for you, but for your village, your culture, your kingdom. You know, in the, in the ancient scripts, there are many accounts of kings and emperors and rulers who, who were troubled by a dream, who went to a minister to interpret the dream for them, who then explained to them that it meant this, that, and the other thing. And that's an important aspect of dreaming. And in the 20th century, there were theorists who... Uh, developed depth psychology around Carl Jung's work. And of course, psychoanalysis goes well into dreams based on Freud and his tradition. But what I had encountered was a different approach that was experiential. It was how do I cultivate a deeper relationship with my own dream life, not just so that I can get messages from my dreams or what I call dream mining, you know, go into the dream world to mine the dream world for things that are useful in the waking world. But what what if the dream itself is an experience? I had a dream where, as I mentioned, my father died when I was 20, and I was completely lost. And I was really angry with him for leaving me alone. And he came to me in a dream. And on my website, dreamosophy.com, there's a, a two-minute video with the story of that dream in which he reassured me that he had done what he could and that he had poured his water of life into me. And it was up to me to go forward into future generations to share what I have to share in the world. And it was very healing for me to have his presence. Now, we can debate about whether I was imagining that or whether it was a fantasy or whether my father actually visited me. You know, these are all areas of dreaming that are very interesting to me. Um, but... From my perspective, I experienced his presence in a way that healed who I am in the world, that allowed me to go on without getting lost in grief or committing suicide because my father was gone. And that moved me and it's such that 40 years later, I was still contemplating these things. And, and so this approach that these folks in Southern California had developed uh, to cultivating a relationship with this so, with your own dream life, almost like finding an old friend again. And most of us have had the experience of finding somebody on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or TikTok that we haven't seen for 20 or 30 years. And it's like, oh my gosh, how are you? What's happening in your life? Uh, that's how we can approach our dream lives, like finding an old friend and reestablishing connection with them. So I wrote this book and it involves – a process that we call the wisdom of dreaming. Dreamosophy literally means the wisdom of dreaming. It's, it's an old term that's been around for several hundred years, but not very well known. And I put the exercises and the activities in the book, and in addition to a lot of philosophy and orientation about the unique approach to dreaming that is dreamosophy, there are a specific sequence of 18 dreams that involve keeping a dream journal, getting a better night's sleep, learning how to recall your dreams, and then beginning to cultivate through answering questions and doing activities to deepen your own relationship with your dream life. And because I had been doing all the green prisons work, I thought, well, how about if we test this on a captive audience? So I went to one of the people that I knew from the Clean and Green Committee, uh, who was a warden in Ohio, and said, hey, um, I've got this new book. Uh, the first chapter is called How to Be Free in Your Dreams. Could I offer a course at your facility? I'll come in. I'll train some peer facilitators 
to present the material that's in the book. I won't charge you anything. Just buy the books and then the $20 a piece for the books. And uh, you can use the books and we'll train the peer facilitators to lead the courses so it'll be self-sustaining. And he said, okay, come and give it a try. And that was six years ago. They're still doing that course uh, at this institution in Ohio. And before the pandemic, we started expanding. One of the other people I knew from the Clean and Green Committee was a warden named Brian Kane, who is a brilliant resource to the corrections community. He was had been a warden at many, many facilities for the Corrections Corporation of America. He's kind of their fix-it guy. If there'd been a riot or a killing or, a, or the place was a mess, somebody had had not been able to do their duties properly, they would send him in to fix it. And then he eventually became their director of security, and he had played a number of roles at, at CCA, now known as Core Civic. And he at the time was at a prison in New Mexico uh, that was an interesting facility because it had county jail inmates, U.S. Marshal Service detainees, federal inmates, state inmates. They just had cobbled together all these different wings of the prison that had different programs and different levels of security. And I said, gee, how about if we do how to be free in your dreams there? And he, he took me out under one of the tiers when I went to visit and um, took me out into the middle of the room as a three, three-story tier, you know, more traditional prison uh, architecture and he yelled out to the people on the tier, hey, there's a guy here to talk about your dreams. If you're interested, come on out and talk with him. And then he walked back and leaned against the wall and left me out in the middle of the tier with these guys. I, I'm no stranger to correctional institutions. I had been on the uh, vocational advisory board for Soledad State Prison out in California for more than 10 years. And you know, I, I had some experience. I used to lead programs for police cadet trainees on how to deal with domestic violence and things like that. So I, I, I wasn't scared to be out there in the middle of the tier. I was actually intrigued. And so I just started talking about dream recall and, and how to be free in your dreams and what it's like. And b- within a few minutes, people were yelling off the third tier, hey, can you tell me how to dream about something other than needles? I don't remember when I've ever had a dream that didn't involve needles and things like that. And so we started doing this program there. And uh, within a couple of years, we were in six facilities in four states. Uh, We were in three facilities in Ohio and a jail in Kentucky and one in Missouri and Brian's facility out. And uh, he he then moved to a a facility in Nevada. So we did it at his facility in Nevada. And it was really, it was fun and satisfying and intriguing to take people who are incarcerated in their waking lives and teach them how to be free in their dreams. And also to weave in the theme of, okay, your dreams for the future are fantasies. You can dream anything that you can imagine, but is it healthy? Is it pro-social? Can you use your dream life to dream up a life worth giving, to go back into the community and live a life that is a contribu- that's a contribution through which you're contributing to your communities because you have a dream for the future that is in many cases discontinuous. It's not the same as your past. It's not a logical outgrowth of where you came from. You can have a repentance experience where you learn how to conceive of yourself and your place in the world in an entirely different way. And we literally dream that up out of nothing out of relationships with teachers and friends and mentors, people can change their lives. And, you know, and and I want to talk a little bit about Brian, if I can, because he, we met at the Clean and Green Committee, and he and I were pretty good friends at all of the ACA conferences, and we talked about his role at CCA and greening prisons and what he was doing and this whole theme of token implementation, like putting on one set of solar panels on one facility. How many facilities do you have in your network? 170. How many of them have solar panels? One. Um, and, and Brian started thinking about the nature of corrections because one of the things that Green Prisons is designed to do is to bring forth a different kind of correctional institution that's an opportunity really to practice corrections. Like Keisha Lance Bottoms in, in Atlanta started talking about changing their the Atlanta jail into a drug treatment, mental health and job training center. 
What a different way of conceiving of the county jail. It's a place where people come to dry out, to get sober, to get medical care, to get dental care, to get eye care, to have a roof over their heads, a pillow to rest your head on, and dream up a better life. And so Brian started thinking about this notion of, of social profit as going beyond private profit. And, and what is really the role of correctional institutions in society? Are correctional institutions producing value, social value, social purpose and meaning for the people who have the privilege of working there? And some people do view it as a, as a privilege. I remember a conversation with Gary Moore from Ohio in which he said, you know, we – treat people in our custody with respect, not because they deserve it, but because of who it makes us into. It's an act of grace because it leaves us an opportunity to live in the kind of world that we want to live in, where people are treated with dignity and respect. And very often when they're treated with dignity and respect, they respond with dignity and respect. The same is true of our staff people in corrections. Do we, do we as institutions, do administrators and planners treat the staff with respect, caring about their wellness and making sure not just that they're safe but that they're okay? Because I know I've had several friends in corrections who killed themselves. We have a very high suicide rate and it's just not fair. It's not right that those people who are dedicating their lives to serving society and making the world a better place are not being taken care of themselves. And so Brian started thinking about this and he went to the folks at CCA and proposed to them two things. One, this whole theme of of what he calls dynamic corrections, to begin to implement a, a corrections institution where the staff are taken care of and they're supported in passing that on to the people in their custody. And then he also kind of saw the writing on the wall that for federal contracts and a lot of state contracts, the, the public is questioning the morals of private profit for corrections. Is that really – it's like private profit medical care. Is it really socially just – for somebody to be making a profit off of incarcerating human beings. And he said, what if we could do both? What if we could have maybe the, the property is owned by a private entity and leased to an institution that has a positive social purpose? And so – and he said as – governments back off from funding private corrections, what if CCA or now CoreCivic were to develop that ability to have not-for-profit prisons that are social benefit prisons, that are social profit or social purpose corrections? And so his website, spcor.org, spcor.org, documents this this evolution of proposing to have socially just correctional institutions whose mission is to prepare people to re-enter society as better, more contributing human beings. And, uh, you know, there are some people who get incarcerated forever, and we as the general public need to have some people incarcerated. I, you know, we all know the stories of people that you don't want as your next-door neighbor. You don't want them meeting their kids. But by and large, 85 to 95 percent of people who are incarcerated can get better. They can become more responsible human beings, especially if given the support they need. And so that's an example of a dream for the future that Dreamosophy is dedicated to that kind of work. And Brian is really doing a great job with that. And his associates. I mean, there are a lot of other people involved with SP Corp. Brian Kane is a friend of the podcast. He was actually on back around, I want to say, episode 85 or so. Uh, I talk, remember seeing that now. Yes. Thank you for talking, reminding me. Talking all about his, as you just laid it out, really uh, inspiring and unique uh, business model. In fact, Brian, who's out west now, was just in town back in Minnesota last week, and he and I had lunch together. So he is still – Change of the world one day at a time, and we root for him 100% yeah. and, and his team. And he has some wonderful productions. people working with him now. Yeah, he's a great team. Say, before we move on, I wanted to go back and touch on some of the things you noted when you were talking about the, the, the power of dreams. A couple of things, and I can ask you. Again, I, I dabbled with lucid dreaming, and as you know, it takes practice if you don't stay at it. It, it, it does. It becomes hard work. Yeah. <laughs> 
But as you said, one of the one of the steps indeed is recognizing when you're in a dream or not. So what I at least the literature I read, they coached us on just pausing during the day to question th- again, am I in a dream now? And they said s- sort of tricks of the trade are um, you lose the level of detail in dreams that you have in real life. So, for example, if you were to right now look at look at your clock or look at your watch and you can read the time, you're not dreaming because in a dream this you wouldn't have that detail. Uh, so things of that nature. So I need to, you've inspired me, Paul. I've got to get back into <laughs> to lucid dreaming. But the bigger tie-in or the bigger question, rather, when when you were talking and regular listeners of the podcast will know we often – talk about themes around desistance from crime and listeners will recognize those variables around hope and belief and agency and self-efficacy. And I know there's a lot of work in the desistance camps around, okay, how can we operationalize this research? And I know, for example, when I've worked with Dr. Ralph Sarin um, up in Ottawa, he, he does exercises with folks where, the encouragement is really to visualize your future crime-free self. What does that look like? You know, write a song or write a poem or or tell a story visualizing that future crime-free crime-free life you have. And now as you speak, Paul, I'm wondering, well, we could tie dreaming into that. Like you said, not just dreaming to have the fantasies of riding a dragon like I do or whatever. But yeah, manifest your future. Start dreaming about that future crime-free self. Do you see perhaps, again, links to that those desistance themes about how folks eventually desist from crime based on how they, how they see their future pathways. It was all a dream. This entire episode was just a dream. I'm kidding with you. Truth be told, I wanted to give Paul and all of his contents their due diligence. So we are going to break this up to part one and part two. Thought that would be a good place to leave you all hanging just as we were about to make that connection between dreaming and our reoccurring theme on this podcast of desistance from crime. So you will just have to tune in to part two of my interview with Paul Sheldon, where we're going to talk about desistance and so much more. So stay tuned for that. We will be back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, The Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, program design, or, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is also on Twitter. Give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C-R-I-M Media Group. You may also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn. And follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this program. And if you believe in what we're doing on the program, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word, tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us, ask them to subscribe to the podcast, and of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. Shut your laptop, shut your mouth, don't say another thing. And I whisper to him, Bird, I have 70 slides to go. (laughs) The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 
Both the Criminologist podcast and the Criminologist channel are brought to you by the Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.